Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Tampa, Florida. We're recovering the National Defense Industrial Association's annual SOFIC Conference and Trade Show, one of the world's leading gatherings of special operators and the companies that serve them from around the world. Our coverage here is sponsored by FLIR, and we're absolutely honored to talk to retired United States Army Lieutenant General Bill Phillips, uh, who was uh, the senior most uniformed acquisition officer in the United States uh, Army. Uh, you now are, are here at the Boeing Company, uh, minding uh, uh, special Operations Forces, as well as uh, Army programs. And, sir, wanted to take an opportunity. First, thank you very much for your, your time. Uh, and, and also ask you, sort of, what are the priority efforts uh, from a Boeing perspective when it comes to the Special Operations Command? You know, what, what are some of the things they're most interested in that you're making and some of the things you're very interested in bringing to uh, SOCOM's attention? First, Vago, thanks. Uh, great to see you again. And thanks for the opportunity and thanks for everything you do to give back. Uh, to our warfighters. We're proud to be a great partner of uh, SOCOM and our soft warriors. As you know, Boeing is world class in platforms, uh, and we can talk about the CH 47 Chinook, the H 6 Little Bird that uh, also is being operated by our soft warriors. But beyond that, we did a lot of other things. Uh, we just stood up the Boeing Global Services, and we're heavily involved in training, training systems, and sustainment operations. Uh, all across SOCOM for all the services that support uh, the command. We're proud to be a great partner in many of those roles. Um, let me, let's, let's go to the uh, 47 Staple helicopter, very important to the company. Uh, we visited uh, Ridley Park uh, when Leanne yeah. Corette at the time yeah. was, uh, uh, was the head of the uh, helicopter uh, part of the company and now of course she's the head of uh, BDSS, uh, Boeing Defense Space and Security. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about what this latest iteration of this sort of classic core product introduced uh, as a Vertol product in 1962 but is still the backbone of Army aviation in a lot of ways, especially on the heavy lift part of the equation. Talk to us about what the MH-47 is going to be bringing the special operators, particularly the 160th Aviation Veteran. Vago, that's a great question. I flew aircraft, test flew aircraft at the Boeing facility while I was in the Army that date back to 1962. This aircraft has been a workhorse for the Army. It's going to be a hundred year platform for us. Uh, it is doing remarkable work uh, today down in Afghanistan. But we also can't rest on our laurels. We have to improve that platform. We're currently developing the Block 2 in coordination with SOF and with Conventional Army. And that's going to buy back about 1,000 pounds of lift capability, maybe a little bit more, and provide our warfighters greater range, greater endurance, and at the end of the day, that's going to be greater capability on the battlefield so they can complete the mission and come home safely. We're proud to be a partner in that. Um, Little Bird is also a very important airplane, uh, particularly from a special operations standpoint. Uh, in, in a really multi-mode, it's got a powerful punch, but it also is a great uh, observation helicopter, terrific agility. We saw it in the demonstration uh, outside <laughs> with its unique, I mean, remarkably quiet helicopter also uh, as well. Talk to us about the roadmap for that uh, platform, given you know it, it, is, it is unique and the special operators absolutely love the airplane. They do love the aircraft, air, airframe, and they uh, they operate it around the world daily. And, and again, we can't rest on what the current aircraft does today. We have to continue to work with our soft folks and improve the platform. And we're doing that through a number of uh, actions to include the airframe, beefing up the airframe, giving it a capability to do greater lift, carry more, uh, go longer range, have greater endurance, et cetera. And let me ask you about, you know, you mentioned uh, services, uh, yeah. training, everybody is looking to get uh, into that business, improve it, especially given the proliferation of technologies that allow you to do it. I mean, you know, Oculus Rift and a whole variety of things are game changing. Can you imagine if you had training like that in your day where you could just sit with an iPad and do IFR and shoot approaches to get that, that muscle memory? Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I play a little bit of flight games. I don't kill angry birds or anything. So, you know, I'm a frustrated aviator here. Uh, but talk to us a little bit on the, on the, the services and on the training piece of, uh, of the business. You, you stood it up. What form does it take uh, in especially the special operations world, which has tended to be more hands-on, more uh, physical repetition in, in experiential learning, as opposed to necessarily going to the sort of digitized systems that we tend to find sometimes in other parts of the force? Uh, Vago, virtual reality today is, is real. It's in gaming. Uh, it's in other solutions that the uh, young adults that are growing up today understand and know how to operate in a gaming kind of environment. What we have done through our Boeing Global Services is create things like the rear crew training system for the CH-47F Chinook that uh, supports conventional and soft. So instead of going out and flying an aircraft for 
$20,000 an hour. We, we are, can operate this virtual trainer to train crews in the, that are in the back of the aircraft for about $400 per hour. Uh, and so it is an immersive virtual reality trainer. Uh, that means that when they go out and they do things like hook up and do stuff like that, they actually get rotor wash effect on the systems that are inside or outside the aircraft, and we make it as realistic as possible. They can train in a classroom environment uh, for little of nothing compared to what the actual aircraft would cost. We have to get to solutions like that, and we're pushing hard. Um, let me uh, take you to a, a broader, uh, more strategic question. Um, if you listen to General Tony Thomas, uh, commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, he's, uh, and, and the entire leadership team, and we've even heard it from senior Army leadership, we're in a great power competition, uh, a period of great power competition. So all of the things that uh, the Special Operations Command has had to do, uh, whether in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Africa, everywhere else in the world, is also going to have to start doing the soft game in a great power context, which is something the U.S. Army did very, very well uh, throughout the Cold War. Um, tell us a little bit about how that's changing, how you think about what the future of the this, this soft market is, which has you know, generally more focused on smaller UASs, well, yeah. personal uh, firearms, suppressors, that sort of thing, as opposed to some of the other real reach and capability, whether it's an EW or a whole variety of, 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 of different challenges. Great question. If uh, General Thomas came by yesterday. We had a, a chance to chat along with Jim Smith, his acquisition executive. I think innovation is the key for us in support of SOCOM. We have to listen to them, understand what their needs are, whether it's UAS system or counter UAS, which is a great need, but also precision strike. If you look at how they operate around the world, you really need a first shot hit. Uh, so that instead of trying to walk something in after three or four shots, we are working on precision guided munitions in a big kind of way with our SOCOM partners to be able to give them the, the ability to go out there, first shot kill. Uh, counter UAS is another uh, effort that we have ongoing, directed energy. So uh, that's something that no matter where they are around the world, we're going to have to provide, the industry is going to have to provide those systems to them so they can complete the mission. Uh, do you, um, from a budgetary standpoint, you were uh, in the senior army team that was dealing with some of the toughest budgetary challenges that we had. Yeah. Um, you know, you were there in the midst of, of sequestration and the challenges that were going on with that. Uh, talk to us a little bit about this budgetary environment that you see the company in. There's this sense that there's going to be a two-year bulge and then a flattening or a decline. How is that changing how you think about where the market's going to be, not just on the soft side of things, but the Army side of things, as you look out there five years? In my four and a half years as a military deputy in ASAL, Vago, as you remember, uh, we never had a budget on time. We were always up operating under a continuing resolution. And I don't think that's going to change uh, anytime near term. That also has an impact on industry and how industry responds to the services and the COCOM, SOCOM in particular, to be able to make sure we continue to do the things that support them. And I would draw back to innovation, listening to the customers, which is so critically important, where the customer may not be able to fund something through IRAD and company funds, maybe we can go after something quickly, and when the budget does come through for the services, we might be able to help them in some kind of way. And Boeing goes at risk, uh, will go at risk using IRAD and various kinds of funds. If we have a high level of confidence that this is something that the services are so calm in particular wants. Let me, let me ask you um, an, an acquisition question. Uh, having spent a career doing this, you know, you've tried to always deliver capabilities as quickly as, as possible. Um, and you were part of a team that was trying to do that even with budgetary uncertainty. Uh, and the Army was very successful pushing capabilities out to the field, even at the height of Iraq and Afghanistan. Two, two very, very important conflicts where the Army was going full gear to, to push capability out to the field. There is a sense and a tendency, everybody looking at SOCOM and saying, oh look, look how fast they can move. But then again, SOCOM is, is, is drawing the most complicated things off of the military services, so it can be agile at that speed. Now the whole effort is to delegate, move faster, be more agile. But from your standpoint, what are the keys and what are the potential pitfalls? Because you can't really fail that fast on a, on a joint vertical lift, for example, which is a big, complicated program of record that is pushing technological bounds. Talk to us a little bit about, from your perspective, what we're getting right right now, 
what we need to maybe reconsider as we go into what is going to be both a challenging budgetary, technology, and threat future. Boy, Vago, we could talk about that for the next couple of hours probably. <laughs> but a couple of things that SOCOM does right. Number one, many of their programs are ACAT 2s and ACAT 3s. So they're able to operate in an environment where they have the acquisition authority to execute and do the things necessary to ensure their support. The services operate in a little bit different uh, arena. One thing that we have to do is encourage our young contracting and program management folks that are out there to take risk, calculated risk, to go out and not hide behind the FAR or the laws and statutory uh, actions that are in place to be able to use them, operate within them, seek waivers where you need to seek waivers, and take that risk necessary to deliver a capability much sooner. The other piece that has to be worked is the requirements and the requirements approval process. It takes way too long. You've heard General Milley in the Army talk about that. He's going after that through the stand-up of the cross-functional teams. That is absolutely spot on. If they can reduce the requirements for a future vertical lift or whatever it might be in a much shorter period of time, 12 months or less, which is what the Army is talking about doing, that's nothing but value added. And we have to stand behind our young contracting officers and PMs. We have to support them. We have to let them take risk. And when they make honest mistakes, then we need to support them and whatever those mistakes may have been that are honest mistakes so that we don't get into a role of them looking at their partners, really looking at their teammates left and right being punished because of an honest mistake. So that builds a culture where people aren't willing to take risk. We need to build a cult culture within acquisition where folks will take calculated risk to be able to get things done to deliver capability to warfighters. Do you think that some of the actions to date are going to be things that are going to help do that? Uh, for example, splitting up uh, the acquisition, the ATNL office into acquisition, which is Ellen Lord, and Dr. Griffin on the technology side of things, and devolving greater authority to the services. Do you think the combination of these actions are going to be beneficial or may be beneficial, but some question marks hanging over it? First, I think devolving uh, the acquisition authority down to the services is exact, exactly what needs to be done. Vago, uh, that is is going to help deliver capability so much faster. And then the breaking up of OSD ATNL into two organizations, I think time will tell. There's two great, great leaders, Miss Ellen Lord and Mr. Mike Griffith. Both of them are seasoned. They understand what the mission is. And I think they're going to do remarkable in their role in terms of oversight of the services and their mission areas. Sir, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for your service Welcome. and all your time. Thank you, sir. It's great to see you again. Thank you very much. Thank Proud you, to sir. be here. Thank you. And it's Mike.